The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. I'm Dr. Rudy Cashman, neurosurgeon, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 41 years, but I'm only 39 years old. This is our continuing series on the treatment uh, of chronic pain. This is be uh, DVD, frankly, number seven. I have with me this evening Dr. Richard uh, Johnson, who will uh, share the uh, platform with me, and uh, we'll have some fun discussing the, the most important aspect in many of the chronic pain patients, the long-term pain patients that have had pain more than six months, is that a significant number of those patients, uh, Richard, are addicted to narcotics. So what do you do now? I mean, we spoke previously in the last DVD, in the last couple of them, about mindfulness treatment uh, of chronic pain, but we really have one additional problem in many of these patients, addition, uh, uh, addiction to narcotics. Yes. So we, and we have to deal with that. I mean, one way of dealing with it is slow withdrawal. I've done that in my office very slowly or three, six months with, withdraw them, and, and that works in, in many patients. But many of them also need some medication, and we'll discuss those uh, also today. But I'd like to go through the process uh, of the uh, addictive uh, disease. It's a disease. What is addiction? It's a disease. It's not uh, due to a weak mind uh, or anything of, of that nature, and, uh, and that's an important point I like to bring across. It's just like having diabetes or cancer or something. It, it needs to be treated, in a, and it's pretty complex. And uh, what, what characterizes addiction when I see a patient? Well, how do I recognize that someone's addicted to a pain medication? Uh, Richard, I'll tell you how overwhelming creating. I can tell in speaking to them, and, and I try to present an alternative you know, to the way they've been treating the pain condition. They're coming in through the emergency room. I see them the next day, and I try to tell them about mindfulness, a different way of treating it. Uh, and you can say, Doctor, I got pain. Don't you realize nothing else will do me any good? That's overwhelming craving. That's overwhelming craving. It's quite common. The other th thing is that the, the, the people that are uh, uh, addicted to narcotics, they're willing to get into harm's way. They're willing to do unusual things. Uh, they're willing to f give, a, uh, give a phony excuses for a prescription. And matter of fact, I had a pharmacist, <laughs> Richard, tell me that he'd like to write a chapter uh, about uh, humorous uh, excuses for trying to give a prescription. That was a house fire. It, it got flushed down the toilet or, or whatever. And uh, he never did come through with the chapter, but it was kind of interesting. And uh, why is this overwhelming craving? and this willingness to get into harm's way. Even some patients will steal the drugs or buy them off the street, and a significant number uh, end up in prison. Look at the jails today. I mean, they're filled full of people who, bu who bought their drugs on the street. Mm -hmm. They were maybe, maybe not quite as rich as some of the people could buy them from their doctor. Aha, uh -huh, Richard. Mm -hmm. The doctor many times writes those prescriptions. And uh, it, there's a change in your chemistry of the brain. That's the point I'm trying to bring across today. Uh, and that it, it would make it very difficult to withdraw the drugs. There's been a change, and I'll mention the chemicals here in a bit. And the people have developed mental and physical, mental and physical uh, dependency. And uh, what's the incidence of addiction uh, to narcotic and medication or addictions uh, in general? 30 million people are addicted to some substance. About 50% are alcoholics. About 5 million do the illegal drugs. The guys from Colombia, the guys from South America. But this one will get you, Richard, hardly anybody knows it. Hardly anybody knows it. 15 million or so, this may not be totally exact number, physician prescriptions, physician prescriptions. Very uh, interesting. No one knows the uh, uh, exact number. And that's something we can do something about. And uh, the biggest cause uh, of addiction 
in this nation to narcotics is from the healers. Very sad. Very sad. And that's why I'm here today to uh, try to uh, uh, change it. And uh, what's the path of addiction? First of all, it's a habit. You know, you get a habit and you experiment with it. You're at a party and you know, let me try this marijuana. Let me try this, this uh, crack cocaine. Let me try this prescription. Uh, at first, it's, it's, it's sort of a trial and error thing. Then, t then it becomes a habit. And then we develop a dependency. We've been taking this, this narcotic prescription, uh, say, for a backache or something for a couple of months now, and we become dependent on it. Uh, you try to withdraw it, and, and you feel uneasy, uh, and, and, and you've got to go back to the doctor to get another prescription. Then you develop tolerance. Now you've got to up the ante. Now uh, uh, one uh, Vicodin four times a day doesn't do it. Now you need two four times a day. That's tolerance in the body. Alcohol is the same way. And, and, we, and then we progress to physical and mental dependency because the tolerance went up, uh, and then we become truly addicted because the chemistry of our brain has changed. That's, that's the process. It's a national travesty, frankly. Uh, uh, we go to war. We fight al Qaeda. over 4,000 people that, di that died in the World Trade Center, uh, and they were hardly selling and uh, growing in the narcotics over there. The Taliban had stopped that. Now they're growing narcotics again to sell them in this country. And I had a general tell me, and I discussed that in more detail, that 30% of the troops that have seen a doctor in the Army are addicted to narcotics. I mean, that's shocking. It was in the newspaper. It was in U.S. News. And I, I called that general up, and I spoke to him. So my meeting with the street, street Star General, uh, we saw this newspaper article, and we traced him down about an hour and a half through the Pentagon and everything else, and we called this Three Star General up. And he doesn't mind me using his name. It's Dr. David Fredovich. Uh, we called him, uh, and because all this information is, is in, in the public uh, uh, sphere, and I asked him personally, because I met with him, that if he could use this information, he said, fine, if it helps somebody. Uh, and he himself became addicted to a physician's prescription. But he said 30% of his troops are addicted to narcotics. So is winning this war, Richard. Who is winning this war? Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw a patient today, uh, a nurse and a patient. And I, we were talking about pain a bit with them because that was a problem there. And, 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 and this was a bit of an impaired patient at born with a little bit a touch of cerebral palsy, I would say. Uh, so not all the faculties were perfectly normal in the nurse. And I said, what do you think is the most common cause of uh, drug addiction in this nation? The nurse didn't know. The patient knew. Isn't that interesting? The patient knew. It was frankly embarrassing to the nurse. And uh, so I called this three-star general up, and, and I said, let me come to Tampa, because I was in Florida. I said, can I come to Tampa uh, to, to speak with you, because I have books and DVDs. This is my seventh DVD. I'm the idea guy to talk to, because uh, I have a lot of information on it. I've written a pain book, The Fraud of Chronic Pain. It's a book I just coming out within three weeks. It's, it's done. And, uh, so I wanted to speak with him there. He said, no, doctor, you can't come here, but I will come and speak to you. So in Naples, Florida, I had lunch with General David Fridovich, a very nice uh, lunch my wife made, and we talked about chronic pain for two hours. He sent me an email two days ago, and he wants me to come uh, either to the Pentagon or to the base and have a larger meeting mm -hmm. so we're getting somewhere because mm -hmm. he doesn't tolerate that many of his uh, army being addicted to medicine. It's natural. Al-Qaeda is beating us at home with their drugs. I mean, this, this, this can't continue. But the thing he pointed out, and I agree, the problem in the general population probably is even worse. It's even worse. He suggested that. I have to agree with that. I asked our psychiatrist at the hospital, Dr. Snyder. He said it's worse in the general population. Uh, what's the cause of some of this? Pain centers. It's too easy to get a, to get a narcotic prescription. I know of pain centers where the addicts laying in the laying in the hallway, uh, and and they all look they all look like all got black clothes, they all got tattoos, they all stay on straight ahead, and they're all addicts. Say what you want, uh, that's that's indeed uh, what they are, and nobody is doing anything about it. I'm upset about it. I'm upset about it. Uh, and how do they do this? The nocebo. We spoke about that in our previous DVDs. The nocebo is negative talk about a study you've done. If you're looking for an excuse to get somebody with pain you, to write a prescription, you need an excuse. You know, just pain won't do it. And they, but you can use an MRI, a CT, an angiogram, see some changes there. 
do negative talk about it, we may have no relationship to what you have. Those changes in the MRI from disc degeneration, which is part of aging, are the cause of your headache and back pain, and here's the prescription, and, and this keeps on going forever. Perfect business. It's a perfect business, uh, uh, Richard. And uh, the disease of addiction, let's talk about it a little bit. It's not a defect in personality. Uh, and the thing to remember, too, is that some of these addictions can cause brain damage. Narcotics can, but especially alcohol. Alcohol will destroy brain cells. Having been a neurosurgeon 41 years, I've operated on a lot of blood clots, blood clots in the head, subdurals are called, in patients who are alcoholics. Their brain atrophies, it shrinks. So there's room in there. Uh, so if they're on Plavix or uh, if they're on Coumadin and they have a light injury, they bleed right into the head and I treat them for blood clots. Very, very common thing. Uh, it's tough to reverse the, that brain damage. Uh, and narcotics do that to some extent too, but not as severe, uh, say, uh, as uh, alcohol would. Uh, narcotics bother more with your neurochemistry of the brain and the chemicals I will discuss. So we can get atrophy or shrinkage of the cortex, the emotional part of the brain, the limbic area, the cerebellum, back to the head, especially alcohol hits that. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, we become numb in the hands and the legs. Uh, narcotics uh, will do that. Uh, alcohol uh, will uh, do that. Uh, this can be partially reversed. In alcoholics, it can be partially reversed uh, in uh, narcotic addiction, but it's especially severe uh, with uh, alcohol. Myths of addiction. Is it a personality disorder? Generally, it is not. And, and these people are not necessarily losers, sinners, a wounded soul. It's really have very little to, to do with that. It has to do uh, with the, ad, the addictive thought process, which I will speak about in a little bit. So uh, another myth is talking is the only treatment. And I, I gave you a, a painter book to read, Richard. Remember, and you, you told me that you were surprised how good drugs actually work. Uh, certain medication you can give for the addictive process. Uh, and uh, uh, so talking is not the only uh, treatment. Medications do help, and I will discuss those. And it's not all about genetics. Uh, certainly, a certain uh, maybe 20% of, of alcoholism, of drug addiction, may be based on your genetic structure, but 80% but is not. It's, it's what you do. It's, it's what you do. And, uh, and drugs and alcohol harm the brain. You can demonstrate it in MRIs, PET scans, SPEC scans. We can begin to demonstrate where these uh, uh, drugs work and where they cause their damage. The disappearing brain, ex especially in some of these to toxic medications, you can see the brain disappearing on these scans. I saw those pictures. You oh. saw those pictures. Aren't they awful looking they things? Are yeah, I, I had someone die this weekend, and, and frankly, he had a disappearing brain. Uh, he came in with a blood clot that was not operable and was a chronic alcoholic and his brain really was disappearing and he lived on the street. A very sad thing, very sad thing. And uh, uh, the cortex shrinks, the cerebellum shrinks, and they're much more prone uh, to faults because the cerebellum has to do with coordination too. It makes it much more uncoordinated. It also affects the neurotransmitters of your brain. The neurotransmitters really... Uh, are the neuropeptides that jump from nerve to nerve. Your nerves don't run from the brain to the foot. Periodically, they have to jump this bridge. These are called neurotransmitters, and they are affected by drugs and alcohol. They, they affect the number, the type, the ratio, uh, and the nerve conduction as a result. So the internal communicating system of the brain is rearranged, is rearranged. Uh, what are the, uh, the neurochemistry, what are the neuropeptides involved? Serotonin? the one that makes you feel good, and dopamine. You have a drink of alcohol, that's why you feel great. You have a drink of alcohol before dinner, serotonin goes up, dopamine goes up, and you feel great. And that's what alcoholism really is all about. The trouble is alcohol also uh, affects GABA. That's another neurotransmitter mm -hmm. in the limbic system, and that's a relaxer. It makes you feel a little better. But the uh, trouble is, as, as alcohol with, withdrawal, uh, the alcohol itself increases the number uh, of glutamate receptors, glutamate receptors. And what does glutamate do? It excites the living daylights out of you. That's why you see an occasional patient who's been an alcoholic or drinks a lot, uh, they quiet down with the alcohol, and at the end of the night, they just go bonkers. That's glutamate at work. Mm -hmm. It can be so bad that, that you literally have to call in the police to take the people home, and I've, I've seen it, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. You literally got to call the cops uh, put them in handcuffs and throw them in jail for the night. That's glutamate at work. 
That's the neurochemistry. GABA relaxes you, glutamate excites you. Uh, so ac glutamate accelerates. It's like hitting the accelerator in your car, and GABA is like hitting the brake. And, uh, and it can cause permanent uh, and, and, uh, and sometimes irreversible uh, uh, brain uh, damage. Can the brain damage be repaired? Some of it can be repaired, especially with medications. There are a lot of medications out there, so I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful here today. Uh, but some of it is not reversible. The atrophy and shrinkage you see in alcohol consumption generally is not reversible they, to a limited extent by, by vitamins and stopping drinking. It is partially reversible. It affects the cortex, the covering of your brain, the limbic system, the emotional part, the hippocampus, the memory part. That's why a lot of these drugs and chemicals affect your memory. They destroy your memory. And it's memory loss. And, and, and most addictions are lifelong illness. You can't use the substance again. Cigarettes, for example, they're addictive. One cigarette, you begin off and running. The same uh, with narcotic medications. You take it just once more, and you're off and running again. So these are lifelong things uh, that you really have to be careful about. Uh, Generally, it takes 6 to 12 months of abstinence for the brain reparative process to start. That's called neuroplasticity. Your brain can change. Your brain can improve. Uh, and so stopping is very important. You, you don't throw in the towel and say, I can't uh, get my memory back. No, that, that, that's incorrect. Uh, and you the, can't. And the sooner, the better. I would and, 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 the, and the sooner, uh, the better. Core beliefs of the addictive system include, I'm alone in a cruel, harsh an unforgiving world. Addictive, addictive teenagers, for example, uh, addictive adults, you, you see that. Uh, they have fear. It's about fear. Fear dominates the addictive process, mm -hmm. and uh, they fear the world. They don't live in the present mo moment. I know you teach mm -hmm. mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, bringing yourself uh, into the present uh, moment, and that's th th the problems with the addictive uh, uh, personality. They can't do that. Mm -hmm. Explain mindfulness to us a minute, Richard. What is mindfulness? Well, mindfulness is a process whereby we are able to move into this moment and feel its fullness, whatever is going on. And we do that without judging and without you know, being critical, all oh, this is happening. So that, I mean, an addictive person is avoiding, avoiding fear, avoiding all kinds of things. If I'm mindful enough, if I have a fear, I just say, oh, I have a fear. I have a thought. I need to have a cigarette. I need to have a drink, whatever. I say, oh, that's a, that's a thought but I don't have to act on it because I'm aware enough. It's like, um, you know, being able to, you're, instead of not being able to see the forest for the trees, I can move back a bit and inside myself observe what my sensations are, what my feelings are, what's my thoughts, what my thoughts are now. And the problem with fear is it's often future-based. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my house. It's often past. Oh, you know, I've gone through so much. People have, you know, treated me so bad. I've got to do this and that. But if I live in the fullness of this moment, I don't have to run to the past. I don't have to run to the future. It takes courage. It takes clarity of mind. But if I do those things, and we teach it. We teach it at, at the Cashman Institute. And when people learn, uh, Dave, Dave Johnson and I teach mindfulness cl uh, classes, when people learn to be mindful, they begin to take charge of their lives and are no longer reacting against. You were talking about, oh, the yeah. bad world. Well, there's stuff in the world, but I don't have to react against it. I can respond. I can be quiet. If there's a conversation where people are saying things I don't want to hear, I can say I need to go someplace else. But I, can, I have a place inside me that's safe and secure that I've created because the human mind has an enormous power to feel whole, and mindfulness helps us feel whole, and people who are addicted don't feel whole. Thank you, Richard. Herb Benson said, there's a doctor living within us. I love Isn't that, that really I what we're speaking that. about? Yes. And we love that statement. Yes. There's a doctor living uh, within us. We need to live in the present moment. Yes. Stop watching the TV and all the news, the bad news coming on there. Mm -hmm. Live in the present moment. You know, it's a pleasant day. I'm right here. Uh, and. Uh, the fear drives the addictive thought process and scarcity, you know, yes. scarcity. It's a mild that scarcity. I don't have yeah. enough money. Yeah. I, I'm not too that successful. Mm. And, uh, and, and uh, we have to look at the world judging us. Mm. It's about judging. Instead of saying, hey, you know, 
it's, it's okay. It's a be beautiful day. Listen to the birds. Look at the flowers. Uh, and There's uh, one word that's so yeah. helpful that pe yeah. many people don't have. It's enough. Yeah. I may yeah. not have all the things yeah. I want, but I have enough. A lot of this addictive uh, thought uh, process, even in, in sexuality, some people have become addicted to that. Yes. Same thing. You know, just Food. one woman won't do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other, in the thought process or the core beliefs, we're judging everything. We're judgmental yes. about everything. Yes, yes, and yes. I even try to uh, uh, apply this to myself. Stop judging people. Mm -hmm. Just look at them and say, hello, honey, how are you doing? How's it going? Mm -hmm. and, and not judge their, their, uh, the, the way they dress or, mm -hmm. or what they're necessarily doing uh, and uh, be less judgmental in ourselves. Uh, and yes. not always think uh, we have to get all that you can. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a trillionaire. You see how many dictators do you see? Who ought to be happy with a few million, and but they're not happy with 20 billion. They got to have 100 billion. Mm -hmm. now, wouldn't he think they turn around and say, you know, maybe I should do something nice for the people now? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just it's this unending process. Get all you can. They're empty inside. They're empty inside. Hopelessness. They feel hopeless about themselves. Yes. My way is the only right way. It's part of the addictive process. Mm -hmm. Always ready to worry. Always ready to worry about mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. and uh, always about the past and future. No mindfulness. Yes. Let's live in the present uh, moment. That's one of the core beliefs uh, in the uh, addictive process. Uh, fear is real. Don't question it. That's the addictive uh, process. Mistakes go for judgment and punishment. No correction. Nothing uh, in learning. Always get to think of the past. Look at the dumb mistake I made. Mm -hmm. uh, other people are responsible for how I feel is a common thought blame, process yeah, in the addictive the process. process. Yeah. Always blaming people. Mm -hmm. I must pit myself against others mm -hmm. instead of some peace. Let's sit down. And you can see families like that. I've seen families like that. Everybody mm -hmm. blaming each other instead of the love of the family from, from getting uh, uh, together. My self-esteem is dependent on pleasing you. Mm -hmm. That's the addictive uh, thought mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. It's not on pleasing myself. And, uh, uh, and, and that I can control other people's behavior, you know, which is... Uh, impossible. And that, that's really the uh, uh, addictive thoughts. And uh, tell us about thoughts. You were telling me the other day you were reading about the importance of, of thoughts mm -hmm. and, uh, and their relationship uh, uh, to mindfulness, uh, Richard. Well, w one of the most important things is to be able to, s to see our thoughts just as thoughts. Somebody talks about thoughts as being clouds passing by. The problem with an addictive person is that they see those thoughts as real. Oh, the world is all against me. Well, actually, they don't much care. <laughs> <all that> much. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. it's all, you know, yeah. it's this big drama, yeah. you know, there's yeah. a drama queens, drama, drama yeah. kings. Yeah. But instead of that, it's say, well, I mean, I have, I have a thought. I have a thought that, uh, yeah. you know, this is a terrible day. It snowed yeah. again, all that stuff. Yeah. And I can say, oh, it's just a thought. And I can replace those thoughts because I can be in charge of my thoughts. I can't exactly control my thoughts, but I can be, I can be in charge of them enough that if, if one comes that doesn't feel comfortable and it's, it's, it leads me down a path of addiction, I've got to have another drink or whatever, yeah. I can say, well, uh, actually what I can do now is, what I need to do is call a friend or whatever it is, but I can be more proactive and more positive and respond to the situation. Thoughts are, in a sense, real, and in a sense, they're insubstantial. But many people confuse thoughts with reality. That I, what I think m means it is so. That's just, that's patently ridiculous. It's not so. But we uh, need to learn that, you know. We, we need to learn that. And as we, if we mature, it's, e it's common for a young person, oh, what I think is the way it is. But as people age, they continue to think of that. They get more and more narrow. I had an uncle who was terribly addicted. And he was, uh, by the time he was 50, he was an old man because everything was about his beer and his pornography. And yeah. he didn't have anything outside that. He got so narrow. And yeah. that was what was real to him, his, his yeah. own fantasies, yeah. his own world, hit, making sure that he, got, you know, when he ran out, boy, he was going to go get more beer. Yeah. And he destroyed his life because he, yeah. became, he became a prisoner of his own thought patterns. Thank you very much. Uh, for explaining that to me. And, uh, uh, and, more, and the addictive process, we look out, outside of ourselves for happiness instead of uh, from within us. Mm -hmm. And a serenity comes from within us. Uh, fear is what egos make. That is yes. what our egos make. Yes. Fear is the core of addiction thought system. Very uh, interesting. 
Fear is the fuel. It's the gasoline. Right. And uh, fear the future. Fear the past. Living in the past and future. Constant judging, being judge uh, uh, mental. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the addictive thought system progresses from fear, past to the future, to judgment, to scarcity. I don't have enough. And, uh, uh, but we need to let go. It's love versus fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. deceptive beliefs in the past and in the future uh, 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 pain. It's a kind and of a living hell, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's a living it. hell, and that's really what addictive process is. And uh, uh, people who are narcotics really have a disturbed sense of time. Minutes, hours, days mm. sort of blur uh, together. It's a very uh, interesting mm. uh, disturbed timeline. Uh, and uh, we can uh, overcome that by release of our own endorphins, our own morphine, mm -hmm. through breathing techniques, mm -hmm. uh, through uh, taking 20 real deep abdominal breaths, secretes our own endorphins, and, uh, and we can uh, uh, feel better. Uh, and there's excessive self-judgment and addiction, a uh, feeling of inadequacy, guilt, compassion, low self-esteem. I uh, have a relative who uh, uh, clearly was addicted uh, to uh, narcotic medication, and you could see it in him, uh, terrible self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, and the family uh, really gave gave up on him. And uh, and uh, uh, but I uh, helped him get a job, and uh, and uh, he became very good at it. Uh, and uh, his self esteem became sky high. And guess what? He yeah. got over the addictive oh, process. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. They had given up. And uh, and uh, but building his self esteem is really what solved the problem. Mm -hmm. You can't judge and have peace of mind at the same time. Stop judging things so much. Uh, when you extend love, you receive love. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, very important in human interaction mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, in a uh, uh, family. The, uh, the addictive thought system it can, it has a great deal about scarcity, always short of something, not enough money, not enough nice possessions, not enough love, uh, seeking to be whole. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose for Life, talks mm -hmm. quite about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's interesting. And, and, and what it really says, uh, 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 people are worried too much about, about their possessions uh, and think that uh, they, they impress their friends and tell you honestly, their friends don't really care. <laughs> and you can't really, take it with you. <laughs> and they can't take it with you. They don't really care, so stop wasting your time on that. Uh, and enjoy your life. I think he has a point. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we think we don't have enough love. We seek to be whole. There's a void in us that needs to be filled as part of the addictive process. And a lot of irrational beliefs. My self-esteem is dependent upon my being approved by everybody on this planet. Mm -hmm. Never going to happen. You know, you think of the doctor, boy, I can make everybody happy. It ain't going to happen, mm -hmm. especially when you deal with addictions. Because I remember getting, a, a, I don't get nasty letters very often, but I got one recently, and I was upset. My manager was upset. The patient was dissatisfied. But when I d dug real deep in the chart, you know what I found? An addict. An addict. Mm -hmm. No wonder she mm -hmm. is not happy with me. You're not I, giving enough drugs. I did not supply. Uh, oh. uh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I did not supply the drug of her choice. That's mm -hmm. where it ended in the end, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she found somebody. She put screws and rods in her back, and guess what's probably going to happen here? <laughs> he, she'll be getting the drug not for him. And I checked it on, uh, on the inspect, and it's exactly what happened. Uh, she's mm -hmm. continued to up the dilaudit. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must excel, achieve, win, and display confidence at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the addictive thought process. Mm -hmm. All things wrong in life are caused by other people. Mm -hmm. uh, external situations in my life aren't exactly how I want them to be. I must feel tense, worry endlessly, and expect disaster to occur mm -hmm. uh, within uh, seconds. If something negative happens in the past, very concerned about repeating itself in the future. We uh, worry about that. And if I avoid painful issues and stuff down my emotions, I'll be safe and happy. Mm -hmm. So we take a drug. Mm -hmm. So we take a drug to feel good. The serotonin and dopamine get circulated. We all like to be in serotonin and dop dopamine, but we've got to find a better way to do it. Uh, jogging, singing, music. Yes. Instead of an addictive drug, which we become dependent on and tolerate, and it increase it, increase it, and increase it. Yeah, the inside, and, the inside, yeah. Um, yeah. those that we produce inside ourselves, we don't have a tolerance for that because it yeah. comes from inside us. Yeah. It's not from, from yeah. outside. Yeah, we should, be, we feel we should be very involved and upset about other people's problems all the time. Even, I see it in the doctor's lounge. People are always worried about the, the world and other people's problems and, and it's pure ridiculousness. That's the addictive process mm -hmm. that, that's a little bit present in, in all of us, mm -hmm. in society, you know, in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, 
uh, there's, there, there's no one right way to view the world. And uh, so uh, we can treat the addictive process through mindfulness. We talked about living in the present moment, mm -hmm. have some acceptance, uh, accept abundance, uh, uh, and love. Mm -hmm. And the stages of drug use, which we discussed already, goes to experimenting, social usage, habituation, increasing tolerance, where we get used to, too used to the drug and we get up it, physical and mental dependency, which is chemically based. Uh, and this changes the neural circuitry of the brain. When we spoke about GABA and glut uh, glutamate, uh, and then we become, then we become a, a, a uh, addict. And uh, uh, the, the, a habit is a superficial psychological phenomenon, not driven by inner issues. So a habit isn't necessarily so bad. You know, we light up a cigarette and someone's on the phone. That's a habit. I mean, it certainly can be addictive, but that's a habit thing. And, uh, uh, habits are, are not necessarily addiction and can be changed a lot easy, more easily. And, uh, we active, and we activate habits automatically in different situations. That's not addiction. Uh, on the phone, bang, you light up. Uh, although I warn you, one cigarette can make you an addict. And uh, uh, let's talk about the Vietnam veterans in a bit. Uh, there was a great deal of dr uh, drug usage in the Vietnam War. But those, those v Vietnamese, I was in that war myself, the Americans that went there, they were only there one year. So it's a little tougher to become an addict. They didn't always have uh, availability of drugs, but only 5% of them ever became permanent addicts. Interesting. But today's soldiers mm. uh, uh, acting differently. Is the human mind maybe different? The thing I wonder about is monetary compensation involved? I mean, I don't you, know. you know what I mean? Are, because are the general is asking me, what's going on here uh, when 30% when, uh, when, uh, are addicted in this war? You know what I mean? Well, maybe and there's it, more availability of legal drugs. Maybe there's more prescribing. This, I think, is where the difference is. In those years, uh, Rich, I think you hit a nail right in the head. The doctors hand out like it's candy, mm -hmm. like it's candy. In the last war, we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. We did not do that. We didn't have the Joint Commission statement that you got to give narcotics for. If you get an eight, you got to give a narcotic. Man, it's, it's, it's a hospital law. Of course, perfectly ridiculous. You got to know why the patients got pain. You can't just say, I got pain, give me dilaudid. That occurs today. And they can make up the numbers. It, 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 they can make up the numbers. I see it in the emergency rooms. I know an emergency room here in town. You go in there, you tell them, get an eight, and they give you dilaudid. You can say, I want two milligrams dilaudid, and you're going to get it. Yes, this occurs today. This occurs today. And uh, so I think this red availability, I, I think the medical profession does not understand pain. I personally think it's the problem. And you're the one who brought it up. So I'm glad that, 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 that you feel this way after all your reading, in my experience. And uh, uh, so the, could the nocebo be, be part of this? Now we have MRI. We didn't have it then. Mm -hmm. Now we have MRI, mm -hmm. and we know nocebo, the patient, the negative talk about the MRI, when it's got nothing to do with the problem, you know, with the backache, I have a backache, you know, they want a pain medication, and we use the nocebo of the MRI, say, oh, okay, justified, you can have the medication, mm -hmm. and call it neuropathic pain, when in reality it's, metabolic pain. Mm -hmm. That could be part of it also. It's very, very uh, interesting. And uh, uh, let's talk about medications. It's interesting. You know, to uh, keep you from drinking, they use antibiotics. Yes. That changes the chemistry and, and the uh, uh, chemicals are formed in the blood. And if you're on antibiotics, you won't want to drink. You get pretty that. sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now they have an excellent drug called Vivitrol. It's a shot once a month. Mm -hmm. uh, that works good for alcohol also. But that drug also can be used for narcotics. Right. Uh, your, your overwhelming craving and the high you get from narcotics is much less. Mm -hmm. So remember that's the big thing from narcotics, overwhelming craving and the high mm -hmm. that you get from it. Uh, uh, now Trexone is another one that is commonly used. Uh, methadone is another one that's used. Now they have a new one called Suffoxone, which is a, a very effective in chronic narcotic usage to, to, but it's still a narcotic. Mm -hmm. The right. general I spoke to, it's in the newspapers, there's nothing violent privacy laws. Uh, he is on uh, Suffoxone, mm -hmm. it's right in, in the yeah, newspaper. So really he's still uh, uh, taking narcotic. Mm -hmm. Dr. Snyder, the psychiatrist at Lufthansa, uh, uh, would say he'd rather stop it altogether. Mm -hmm. That's difference of opinion, mm -hmm. and, and, and both are valid. Both are, uh, are valid. Mm -hmm. Sulfoxone is taken for about nine months to a year, uh, and but of sulfoxone, you don't get the craving, mm -hmm. and you don't get the high. Mm -hmm. Key. Yeah. Key. So that's key. Uh, so you can function pretty good with it, but you still 
uh, on a narcotic medication. Mm -hmm. uh, what Dr. Snyder uses is Lyrica. He, 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 he oh. stops everything. There's a little transition zone, and he gives up like uh, high doses of Lyrica. What does Lyrica do? And, uh, and uh, it occupies the narcotic receptor sites. Oh, the, the uh, keys, uh, yeah. And not totally like uh, sulfoxam would do, but pretty good that you can uh, withdraw and uh, get away with that. Mm. And uh, uh, we talk about agonists and antagonists, and agonists is the one that, pro that uh, produces the action. The antagonist stops the action, the blood. So the agonist... Uh, uh, the antagonist blocks the action and the agonist produces the action. Mm -hmm. So we have drugs of both types. And, uh, and sulfoxone uh, blocks uh, a lot of uh, the agonist sites. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to have a special license to subscribe sulfoxone, I found out uh, the other day. And be, uh, because it's, it's a little bit tricky. Not highly dangerous, but a little bit tricky. Because when you stop the narcotics, the major narcotics, that's about a week's transition zone and you should be on some uh, Ativan or, or Motrin or something uh, in the transition before you go into Sulfoxone. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm reading about it. I personally have never used the drug, uh, but because I think it takes experience uh, you know, to use it. And uh, I have been following the system of withdrawing people slowly, and, it, and it's been fairly successful. Uh, but uh, there are different ways of treating these uh, uh, conditions. So Vivitol blocks the receptor site. Mm -hmm. It's an injection once a month, good for alcohol, good for narcotics. Now, here's an interesting drug coming up, Camtrol. Uh, very interesting. It heals the brain. Mm -hmm. They don't know exactly how it works, but it goes in the limbic system, and it heals the, relation, the relationship of GABA and glutamate. Oh, yeah, Remember right. GABA, the relaxer, that, that hits the brakes, and uh, glutamate, the accelerator. And, and that relationship, Camtrol brings that over a period of months in, into uh, stability. So that's a very good uh, drug uh, to use. So uh, drugs have value in this addictive process. And, uh, uh, and they block the receptor sites. And uh, a control uh, reduces the cravings about uh, 90%. Uh, I'm talking about Vivitrol decreases the cravings about 90%. You mm -hmm. take, I think, 380 milligrams. But, but uh, check with your doctor. This is, I'm not rec recommending it to you. I'm just, this is just informational. And all and of this uh, you use is yeah. you have an endpoint. One of the things yeah. you always emphasize is yeah. you're going to give something to help someone yeah. make it through. Man, you've got yeah. to have an endpoint. Yeah, Vivitrol I think is 380 milligrams. Comtrol you've got to take I think 2,000 milligrams, a pretty good dose. Mm -hmm. So they give it three times a day. But again, follow, follow your physician's recommendation, mm -hmm. and it balances the neurotransmitters. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, GABA relaxes you. Remember, glutamate revs you up, steps on the accelerator. Uh, alcohol increases GABA relaxes you and accelerates the glutamate. And when you see an alcoholic out of hand, they're on the glutamate. And at that point, they start beating up people, shooting people, and punching people. And there's no way to control it. Uh, and, and to even consider that they are in control of anything, all you can do is you know, get them to bed or lock them up or whatever. Restraining. They start beating on your family, off to jail you go. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, a very interesting process. Uh, revolutionary approach, subsoxone is a, a real revolutionary. Uh, the uh, uh, chemical name really is uh, buprenorphine, and, uh, and that name was actually in the newspaper from the journal. Uh, that's the name they actually use. It's a partial agonist. Uh, it, it does produce the narcotic effect a little bit, uh, but uh, it occupies the receptor sites, so you don't get the overwhelming craving, and you don't get the high. So you can reduce the addictive process. Less craving, no high. It gums up the receptor sites, and you develop some opiate resistance. Just like insulin resistance, you develop some opiate resistance. Uh, you will have some withdrawal symptoms when you, when you stop your narcotics. So for a few days, you, you need some transition drugs. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, and uh, let's talk about the nucleus uh, accumbens. It's in the brain stem. It, it causes secretion of a great deal uh, uh, of uh, dopamine. That mm. can be stimulated by music, uh, meditation, mindfulness, mm -hmm. makes us uh, uh, feel good. Feel good, and that's part of the addictive process. Uh, when you take a narcotic, it hits the nucleus accumbens, and that gives that tremendous high, mm -hmm. the tremendous dopamine, and that's where ecstasy comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, you're withdrawing, you, develop, you become excited, uh, you can develop sleepiness, seizures, depression, all alcohol and drug withdrawal can do that. Uh, and they can use uh, Ativan, Motrin, Clonidine as transition drugs to Suboxone until mm -hmm. uh, you uh, start the uh, uh, drug. 
And uh, the 12 step program is, is mentioned in some of the books. Some people don't totally agree with it. Remember, remember what I said? Some people think you should, ought to accept uh, abstinence, need to accept Carr's book on smoking. Uh, you stop it completely. Uh, and odds are better recovery because when you're taking a cigarette now, then you're still feeding that little monster. The same with drugs. And, uh, and some people don't believe uh, that, in the, like in the 12-step program, that you have to admit that you're at the bottom and looking up before you get better. But it's a very effective program. It is. I mentioned it. It's a very effective it program. It should be used and tried. But uh, there's still some discussion about it, you know. And, uh, but it teaches methods of dealing with the craving. Uh, it's group therapy, individual support. You meet somebody, you can call them up anytime. It's a wonderful system. It and is. It gives you a partner, and I totally believe in it. So you're dealing with the psychological, the family, the legal, the medical, and the social problems. They're used to it. So it's a wonderful system. What I'm saying is the approach to addiction is a holistic thing. Yes. It's mindfulness teaching. Uh, you are the expert on teaching mindfulness uh, through uh, 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 conservative methods through uh, body uh, uh, methods to mindfulness healing is what you teach for stress and for uh, uh, addiction. Uh, very good method, well known. Covet uh, Zen and Mass General uh, promoted it highly, and it's going over the country. I'm going to bring it, frankly, to the U.S. Army. They've asked me. Absolutely. To, uh, they asked me to bring mindfulness to the U.S. Army, and uh, but it's a complex issue. We have to have many approaches mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the addictive process. Best thing, of course, to avoid in the first place. I'm a legal addict. That's what I see a lot of. That's what I see a lot of. I see patients, uh, and that's the difference. That's the difference in the prison population. Why do you see so many minority people in these prisons? Because for them to get a drug, a lot of them have got to go to a dealer on the street. They get arrested. The well, the do person can go to a doctor and be given a legal prescription, and he says, "I'm a legal addict. I'm taking narcotics regularly, but my doctor is giving me prescriptions every week at the pain center, especially." You know, he talks to you 30 seconds, hands you another prescription, come back next week, and you can lay in the hallway waiting on line, and you get another prescription, $60, please. That's the legal addict. I heard him say in the emergency room, you know, doctor, I'm a legal addict. I've had it said to me. Mm -hmm. I've had it said to me. And that's a problem here, because they arrest the illegal addict, and they don't arrest the legal addict, and they don't arrest the guy prescribing the legal prescriptions. Mm -hmm. That's a problem here. It, it needs to be faced. It needs to be faced. Uh, I, think that what is, I think the problem is, and I'm trying to do something about it, uh, there's the right to be wrong. But I think the problem is doctors don't understand chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And my previous DVDs explain what is my interpretation of chronic pain. I think I'm right, I'm especially right because I wrote that book, Nocebo, The Evil Twin, where I point out how negative talk is used to convince people there's something wrong and they have the right, therefore, for a narcotic. That's the basic problem, I believe. And uh, so I think I'm experienced with it. Uh, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, doctors are too busy to talk to the patient. That's out in general practice today. They don't necessarily get paid for that, although I'm a busy guy. I seem to have time. And in the Army, that may be part of it, too. You know, there aren't enough doctors to cover the Army people. No, no mm -hmm. way. Not mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Draw a description and out of their life. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't give the narcotic prescription, you've got a half hour of talking to do. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it's happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, addicts are extremely unreasonable. Extremely unreasonable. Unless you muscle it and spec the time, you're not going to convince them that they don't need that drug. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult. Very difficult. Uh, we need to ask uh, the patient when we see them and they have a pain problem. We need to know what's going on in your life. We need to know whether they have metabolic pain, which I described in my previous DVD, or whether there is a real relationship to something wrong. Was their leg amputated? Did they have a broken leg, a broken hip? Did they get shot in the head? That's a different story. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about pain where we don't know why they got it. I got pain. Why do you have it? I've, I've uh, read a book where uh, Dr. Morrison said, pain is a disease. It's not a disease. Please. It's a symptom. Mm -hmm. The disease is what causes the pain. Mm -hmm. Chronic pain is a symptom complex. And we can't keep on feeding it uh, with narcotics. And you know, one, one thing I think about, you're talking about the Vietnam War and now, yeah. I don't know, but it seems to me that m a, a larger proportion of our population believes I should have no pain ever. Now, I had chronic pain, and it's not nice. I don't like it. But I began to look at it and help change it because I began to accept that I had it. And there's, I think our culture is saying more and more, we should be able to live without any pain ever. 
And that's not the human condition. In the human condition, we're going to deal with a certain amount of pain. It seems to me that's, that's more human to accept that it does happen sometimes and that we need to be accepting that this is a possibility for us. Richard, you're absolutely right. Life is not without pain. Absolutely. I mean, some people, you're right, that life is a disaster. I mean, there's life and death. Right. There are disasters through our lives. We right. have to learn to accept that. People that we love die. I mean, all yeah. kinds of things happen. Exactly. We can't just uh, accept a narcotic for every little bump in our road. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and people, I think, do feel they don't have pain. And when the Joint Commission came out with this pain thing, you say what you got. We got to feed you a narc for it. It was the most ridiculous thing anybody could have done. When did that happen? That's, that, uh, I think 10, 15 years ago. I didn't That's know the that. cause of a lot of this. Yeah. It needs to be undone. Because on the ward in the hospital, the patient says he got an eight. The nurse is obligated to call the doctor to, to give a medicine that matches an eight. It's the truth. Otherwise, they'll write the doctor up. Sounds like an illusion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I fight this every day, telling the nurse, please, we can't give this, to this, this morphine to this patient because I don't know what, what their problem is. And we don't give it for metabolic pain. For that, as a relaxer, a massage. Talk to them. And it's, it's very complex, and that's a big problem. And I understand the confusion in the medical community, but I'm trying to change it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I read this book, a uh, very good book, uh, by Jane Mitchell, uh, Addict, Addict Nation, she calls it. And, and, and it's a, a very good book. And she goes through this process of, of physician prescription, the whole chapter on it, and she's absolutely correct. Uh, she's absolutely uh, uh, correct. And... Uh, and she gives examples of, fam of falling stars, and there's an unending number of famous people. Michael Jackson, for example, I mean, uh, was killed by a prescription medication. Wow. I mean, just totally ridiculous where they gave him, they gave him an anesthetic drug. And where are the pink suits? Please, where are the pink suits? The government must act. Uh, if, uh, they're throwing the poor people in jail, but the people writing the prescriptions uh, keep uh, making fortunes. The biggest houses in this area own by people who run pain centers uh, and who do uh, a lot of them unnecessary surgery. They do these procedures that with a nocebo effect. Uh, they're the ones making the money. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I don't care if they make a lot of money, that's fine. But you gotta make it honestly for Pete's sake. You can't be just dealing in pain to do it. And, uh, and, uh, and wear the pink suits, please. And uh, movie star Corey Haim is described uh, by Mitchell in her book uh, chronic relapsing all the time, eventually died. And uh, wealthy people don't have to hit the street to get legal drugs. They, they just got to go to the doctor. And, uh, and, uh, and this has to be dealt with. This has to be dealt with. I've, God knows how many times have I, have I gone to hospital administrators and asked them to do something about the pain centers. They do nothing. Do nothing. And, uh, and uh, the poor have to buy f uh, pain medication from the street. They get caught and they go to jail. How many millions of people do we have locked up today just because of drugs, especially young people? Their lives are ruined. 20 years in jail, do you think they're going to get a job when they get out? Give me a break. And the uh, uh, presence of full of poor drug people. Uh, shop, shop till you drop. Doctor shopping. The patients go from one doctor to another doctor to another doctor uh, till they get medications. I know of some practices that exist where they prescribe nothing but narcotics. It was told to me by a doctor from Huntington. He knows of three practices. He covers them. Uh, that's his job, covering people on vacation at night. Uh, where He says, I know three practices uh, where uh, uh, all they do is prescribe narcotics. You would think somebody would catch on. One half a narcotic pill can put a patient into a disease forever. Yeah. Uh, many addicts from physician scripts. Pain centers are all over the country, many addicts. It's everywhere. It's not just here. It's just everywhere. It's, it's in the U.S. Army. Uh, Al-Qaeda is uh, beating our army with narcs. We prescribe them, but they're grown. A lot of them are grown over in Afghanistan. It's true. Before we went to war, they weren't growing them there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you tried growing a narcotic, you didn't have a head very long. Maybe that wasn't so bad. I don't know. I'm just making a little discussion here. Uh, it's a bigger problem than that we know. It's a much bigger problem. Ten percent of the people riding down the street are, are on some medication that could kill us. Ten percent. Ten percent on a tranquilizer or a narcotic. Ten percent. Yes, today. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's ten percent. And uh, driving around in a fog. Absolutely. Absolutely. And... Uh, 
the biggest and fastly growing part of American drug problem is prescription abuse. 15 billion yearly spent on drug smugglers should be used to treat and prevent addiction. I agree. Ten of it. Give five to the, to the guys in Columbia. And, and, it's, and it's, I think it's politically based. Mm -hmm. The best I can make it why it doesn't change. Uh, and this lack of knowledge by physicians, too. You'd think the AMA would be leading the change, uh, but everybody's got their head in the ground. People are making a lot of money. A lot of money is made here on, on chronic pain mm -hmm. in terms of operations, uh, pain centers, uh, a tremendous amount of money made here. Uh, companies that sell these things, pharma, big time pharma uh, involved uh, here, sp they spend billions advertising these drugs. They do. Uh, it's an American drug conspiracy. Who's involved? Law enforcement. Uh, I've talked to FBI agents in this town to please have a look. And, uh, and uh, uh, the federal government, the medical community, the pharmacy, millions in jail except for providers. Most pain centers make millions of dollars, and I am not kidding because I see 50 to 100 blocks a day in some of these centers. It was told to me by an employee there. And then the Rolodex of, of narcotic prescriptions, you would think that the inspect system, which is a federal program, would catch these people. But you know what it is? If the doctors don't understand chronic pain, how would the federal government understand it? That's where it's needed, right there. I, I, right it's there. hard for them to understand it. I, I, I see the point there. Mm -hmm. But I'm out here with the DVDs, watch them. I gave my, my DVDs, the ones I had done, five of them, to General uh, Fridovich. Mm -hmm. He took them, carried on to the government. So we're getting somewhere, and he's going to get these additional two next week. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice general, mm -hmm. very sincere. Mm -hmm. And I'm meeting with him again in March. Maybe something will change. And uh, uh, American drug conspiracy. For the upper middle class, it's a lot safer to go to a doctor and get these drugs than it is to go to the street and put yourself at, at, at risk of being arrested. Our nation is in the throes of a prescription drug abuse crisis of unprecedented proportions, and our myoptic, jaded, and complacent criminal justice system sees no evil, hears no evil mode. Mm -hmm. We need a war on prescription drugs. I see people in their 80s on 15 medications. It is not just, uh, uh, it's not just narcotics. It's tranquilizers and its use of other medications, which an 80-year-old never should be taken. I saw a lady recently on two milligrams of methadone for a backache. What did I do with her? Uh, I taught her how to exercise and strengthen her back to help her backache. She loved it. I sent her for massages, exercises, uh, and taught her body recall, which my yoga instructors teach at the Mind Body Institute. Uh, and she just loved it, all the social contact. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, she was so thankful, came back, gave me a big hug. And, uh, a lot, and I took away 80% you know, of her medications, mm -hmm. and she was still alive, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. we, need a, we do need a war on drugs, but a different kind of a war. We need a war on legal drugs. We need a war on legal drugs. Very little spend on the biggest war uh, of all the legal drugs. In the addict's mind, it's okay because it was prescribed by a doctor. I'm a legal addict now. Mm -hmm. Sure makes it easier to cross the line of addiction. You see that, Richard? I do. It's a lot easier. I've noticed that six or eight years ago, the drug of choice was heroin and crystal meth, but, but we couldn't intervene. Today, I would say it's 30% alcohol, cannabis, and cocaine, and crystal meth, and 60% prescription drug addiction. This is a statement from a counselor in out of Mitchell's book. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. 60% prescription drugs. We need to act. We need to act. We've got to work on prevention. The, We've the got to work on prevention. About, yoga and, yeah. and meditation. Yes, we need to, need to do exactly right. But what do you do? You know, withdraw them from the drugs. But that's the reason we established an institute, uh, Richard, where you teach mindfulness, stress reduction, uh, and, uh, and uh, withdrawal of uh, narcotic medication and mindfulness techniques from exercise to, to, to uh, use of some medication mm -hmm. to get rid of this monkey off their back. I know two people well whose lives yeah. are totally different because they did what you're describing yeah. right there. Yeah, and you, and you taught it to them. Yes. You, and Richard, you taught to them, and I thank you for it. That's why I have you there. And uh, uh, lobbyists should be run out of the country who promote uh, these narcotic drugs uh, uh, to the Congress because they have them tied up with money. They spend billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Insurance companies won't even pay for a mindfulness course. <laughs> Would you yet. believe it? Not yet. Well, not yet, but they will. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. changing. It is changing. And uh, the government needs to, t needs to take action. They would save so much money. Uh, we will uh, put this 
uh, these DVDs uh, together in, into a series of seven. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to discuss them for a minute. Number one is, uh, my book is coming out, The Fraud of Chronic Pain, which is a thorough discussion uh, of the chronic pain issue. My thoughts on it, and I call it a fraud because we're all involved with it. The human body is involved with it. Uh, chronic pain tells you there's a pain. There's no reason to have it. It's not warning you of anything. Acute pain tells you you get a broken leg, we need to fix it. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there's a fraud there. It's a medical community, uh, it's a government, it's the patients. They collect quite a bit of money of a disability because of pain. And, uh, but I go through the whole thing from, from the fraud of chronic pain to discussing acute and chronic pain. We have a DVD of the nocebo, the negative talk, mindfulness teaching uh, uh, that uh, you give on, uh, in a, uh, a mindful way of treating a, a chronic a holistic uh, pain treatment. Uh, one by uh, David Johnson on stress re reduction, and then we have a DVD uh, on holistic methods of treating chronic pain from mindfulness to uh, yoga to Tai Chi to Qigong uh, to music to massaging. Exercise. I mean, we, exercise, diet. Yes. We have all these modalities which we teach. Uh, and then uh, number seven, how to deal with the addictive process and the addictive uh, uh, mind. Uh, so I think we are indeed uh, attacking uh, 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 the problem. What are your thoughts on this, uh, Richard? Are we getting somewhere? <laughs> well, I think we are. And I agree with you about uh, all of these different things, the federal government, all these others, uh, and doctors. But I always think that the best way to work is with people, like having this yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, an individual says, I have a friend who is addicted to something. I want to talk with Dr. Cashman. I want to come to the Cashman Institute. I want to change my diet. I see that I have a tendency. Maybe somebody says, I have a tendency towards some of this. I have a tendency towards stinking thinking, which is what the AA, you know, AA calls it. Yeah. I have a tendency to be caught in fear. Here are some concrete things I can do. Because often what happens is these movements for change happen with people. That somebody says, I've got to make my life better and enough people begin to make their lives better, that becomes a whole movement. There's a whole, the, the people who are now coming to the Cashman Institute, I've talked with them. I'm in, a, I'm in a yoga class, I was talking to a woman, she says, you teach stress reduction? Oh my gosh, I've got to take that. So there is a, there are people in the world who know what you're saying, what you say rings true, and they have friends and family who are involved in some of those legal addiction problems, and they begin to intervene and talk and seek to do something about it. I think that's very important. Richard, those are beautiful words. You're absolutely right because that has been my experience uh, of my practice over the years. The best referrals that I receive from my office are from patients. Mm -hmm. The people figure it out. Mm -hmm. And in my experience today about the nurse and, and, and the somewhat uh, slow patient, she knew uh, what the problem is, and they do spread the word, and they do send you patients. And I think we will uh, change the way this is per perceived, a person at a time. Yes. At no time, I think, can you... Uh, and this, just look at the Middle East today. How did this change happen? What a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful uh, example. It was done by the people. Absolutely. It was done by the people. It wasn't that we intervened or anything else. The people did it. And I think in this mindfulness business, the treatment of chronic pain and reducing the amount of drug uses in the community, uh, indeed, uh, will be done by the people. Yes. And, uh, and I appreciate very much uh, you listening to us today. I hope you could uh, watch uh, these uh, seven DVDs, about six and a half hours. Uh, you will certainly know chronic pain uh, after watching those, but I'll be honest with you. You need to understand it and to save your life and get over it. Uh, I think this is a critical thing. And uh, if, you, if you're a patient and you have this problem, uh, we, uh, I think this would be excellent. These would be available. You can get them at the Mind Body uh, Institute. And I would hope uh, some of the teachers, some of the physicians would watch these. And, and I know the U.S. Army is watching them already because I gave them to them. And they wrote me an email and how much uh, they liked them. Again, Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard, for, for helping me with this program. Thank you for listening, and uh, namaste. Uh, we love you all and hope to uh, uh, see you again at some of our programs and lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>